Okay, so we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this session uh, titled Knowledge Making is Imaginative Practice as part of the Creative Brain Week. Uh, absolutely thrilled to be here, and thank you, Dominic Campbell, and everybody in the organizing committee for putting on such an amazing event. And I'm so thrilled to introduce you to this uh, session speakers as well. Um, this session is a series of case studies of artists, scientists, and uh, professionals working together towards health and towards bridging divides. And I want to echo Dominic Campbell's words uh, right now. Uh, he said, thank you for bringing the chaos. So please uh, do bring the chaos to this session and all the inspiration, uh, the cross-fertilization, and the free spirit of creative practice. First of all, I want to start by introducing to you Dr. Adolfo Garcia. Adolfo is the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at UDESA uh, University in Argentina. He's also a senior Atlantic fellow for equity in brain health at the Global Brain Health Institute. And Adolfo will speak to us today on failures to communicate science and hopefully a, a fair bit of success as well. So we're looking forward to your presentation, Adolfo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me all right there? Yeah? Awesome. And this should work. Will it work? Can we bring the slides up, please? And there they are. Yes, awesome. All right. So I'm going to be talking about how not to communicate science. Basically, this is going to be a tour de force into everything that I've done wrong over the years. Yeah. So get ready to feel, to get, have a good laugh at my expense. Yeah. Um, but mainly the thing that I want to do today is uh, what follows. All of you are consumers of science news, yeah, daily. And many of you also are communicating science or have the chance to do so. So I'm going to be speaking to those two uh, subpopulations in the audience, if you will. Um, this is the roadmap. We're going to be talking about some general notions about communicating science, uh, some of the mistakes that I've made. Uh, I'm going to be wrapping things up. And Q&A, no, that'll be saved for last, I guess. So let's talk about communicating science. There are a couple of notions, there are a couple of terms that are thrown around there. You may have heard about science dissemination. Yeah, or science popularization. And those terms are quite useful, uh, quite widely used. But the thing is that they are quite asymmetrical, right? I mean, it's the researcher who disseminates. It's the researcher who popularizes, in a way. When you talk about communication, you can, you can go to the etymology of the word, and it is to make common, right? So communicating science is not just about the asymmetrical, unidirectional process of the one who knows telling those who don't what things are all about, but actually of co-constructing knowledge. And there are unprecedented conditions for this to happen nowadays with technological advances and whatnot. Um, why should you even do it? First of all, it's a social responsibility. If you are a researcher or if you work in any other arena that's concerned with brain health or whatever your specialty is, and you're only talking to those who belong to your field, then you're being endogamic, right? And we believe, I hope, that what we do is important beyond the confines of the people that do what we do. So this is, it, it is our social responsibility. It's incumbent on us to try to spread the word beyond the limits of our disciplines. You can empower people through findings. Uh, we are, uh, I mean, fake news is something that permeates all social media. And um, we can, if we have the chance of bringing some scientific information in the hurricane of misinformation that's out there, you are giving people the chance to act on other types of data. You can involve populations in the process. And this is quite good, because you can get feedback from different actors uh, and improve your science, improve your methods, improve the questions that you're asking. And uh, you can also contribute uh, and engage in dialogue with them. You can self-regulate through criticism because your peers, other scientists from the same field, from other fields, are, are, are going to have the chance to comment on what you're doing. And that is a great source of um, uh, improvement and progress. And 
Of course, you can draw inspiration from other scientists by seeing what they are doing. There are many good examples of how to communicate science, Scientific American. It's uh, interesting to see that some uh, uh, adventures in, science, in the communication of science began as weird extravaganzas, such as Neuroskeptic, uh, which was a little blog, and then was incorporated as a section in the Discover magazine. Uh, in Latin America, for the Hispanic population, El Gato y la Caja, they are doing amazing uh, work, high quality writing with high quality science, uh, and of course, our very own GBHI blog, which I invite all of you to check regularly, great stuff being communicated there regularly. Now, everything that you may want to be aware of, I'm going to be sharing with you some um, anecdotes of things that went wrong and that I learned from. Something that I used to do wrong uh, is what follows. You are giving an interview, right? Somebody's asking you about your work. And something that I tended to do was to try to explain the whole story right from the first question. So a very bad strategy, right? When they're asking you about something, give the, the interview time to flow and do not give details right up front. If you're thinking about what you wrote, the abstract may be a better guide than the full paper when it comes to see how you're going to digest and communicate what you're doing. So uh, leave room for follow-up questions, because another thing you may be doing is just um, impede the possibility of dialogue, which is what really differentiates an interview from an exposition or a monologue. So for those out there, don't trip on that stone that I've tripped on so many times. Another thing to be aware of is the blindness of erudition. What is obvious to the expert may be revealing to the lay person. And I remember I was auditioning for a, a TEDx talk. Uh, you have to go through a number of auditions. And uh, I was, uh, my, my, my talk was about the links between the brain, body, and, 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 and movement and language. And I was going through these ideas. And one of the judges, there are judges, pretty much like American Idol, but they're way meaner, right? And, uh, and one of them said, wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that language has to do with the brain, right? And then it hit me. Right. I mean, there are things that you just take for granted, right? Because they are the very axioms, the premises upon which you work when you're in a specialty field. But those very basic notions may be the thing that you want to communicate or start by communicating when you're facing someone who does, who does not belong to your field of expertise. Um, the how on the part with the what. I remember back in the day, something that I used to do was to just com comment on and mention the findings of our study, completely neglecting the methods through which we had uh, achieved or, or obtained those findings. Very bad idea. If you only communicate what you found, basically you're asking your audience to take a leap of faith and to just trust in what it is that you are doing. It's no different than communicating any other thing that you would expect people to take at face value. What really differentiates science from other forms of knowledge out there is the methods. It's how we do things. You can have questions that are similar across uh, folk psychology, um, I don't know, common sense, uh, art, but what really differentiates science is how we go about answering those questions. And when you do that, when you comment on how you, you achieve those results, you're empowering your audience because you're giving them the tools to be critical about them. Oh, so you did this, but you didn't control for this. And did you inquire about this? So make sure if you come from the world of science to try to say how you did what you did. Don't go just to the results. And if you're framing this from an audience perspective, be mindful of those who only tell you what the results are. Because if you just take them at face value, you may be uh, uh, biting the bait uh, in a way. Um, the value of I don't know. This is very important. Mis 
distrust. Do not trust those people who have an answer for everything. I mean, no walls in things are as complex as the, the, the matters that we deal with here are quite dangerous. And most likely, you're, it's either one of two choices. You are facing a God who's omniscient and omnipresent and really knows everything. Option two, you're facing a charlatan <laughs> who has the, the, the pretensions of a God, but not the, the, the tools. And I remember uh, I was um, part of this radio column for two years, and uh, it was about language and, uh, and cognition, right? But the host, he would ask me about anything. Oh, so neuroscience, right? Uh, what's the impact of carrot eating on your frontal lobe? And the worst thing you can do is to try to sort of start riffing an answer there, right? No, don't do it. Say Listen, this is beyond my turf. I don't know this. Not only because that's uh, the, let's say, morally right thing to do, but also because it will highlight, it will empower the questions that you did reply to. If you have the decency to say, I don't know about this, it will strengthen the responses that you did because the, 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 the undertone is, okay, so the other thing this guy did know about. And... Uh, and from an audience perspective, you know, be wary of those people who do dare answer everything. Um, discoveries or results, something uh, that we have to be careful about is not presenting individual results as revealed truths. You find something in one paper, especially if it's the first time you find something. So you go there and maybe you're tempted to say things like, well, what we showed is that this this works like this. This parcel of the brain or reality is like this. But careful there, because an empirical result is not the same as a universal truth or a factual demonstration. For something to jump from the sphere of a result to a fact, what you need is replication. Many, many more works done independently that converge into the same result. And unfortunately, neuroscience is one of the worst fields at doing that, because neuroscience rewards novelty over replication. So careful there. Uh, and um, from a communicative perspective, I think it's important to be explicit about this, to state that what we, what, what we are commenting on is something that was found in one, two, maybe three papers, but not to um, uh, place that under the guise of something that is universally uh, valid and fully discovered. Especially because when you do many replication studies, um, there was this famous study done a few years ago, out of the 100 most cited studies in cognitive and social sciences, 30 of them upon replication showed same results, 30 of them did not reach significance, and the, the other 30% showed completely opposite results. So let's be careful and humble about how we communicate what we are doing when we are, when our uh, material is the one paper that we have to discuss. Uh, state what a result does not mean. I mean, cancel spurious inferences. So if I, if you say, and this I learned uh, the following way. I was commenting on a study that had shown that people remembered information from a lecture better when they took notes shorthand than when they did it with a laptop. And this is the, what they wrote on the cover uh, of a newspaper where that, where that interview took place. Uh, scientists recommend not to take notes on your notebook. You learn less. <laughs> that's not quite right. So that's not what I said, but all of a sudden that is what Apparently, I had said, right? So that taught me this lesson. Say what you want to say, but also try to anticipate those misinterpretations that journalists may fall prey to and cancel them. Say what you don't want to say. And that's a, a good safeguard for you as a communicator, but also for your audiences so that they don't have to find this in a newspaper and just gulp it down. Um... And this is the, the final one I will mention today. I have many more, but request 
power of review. This is what I refer to as the Chinese calamity. So I was in China, conference, keynote speak, uh, uh, conference that I'm giving. It's about bilingualism. And my, main, my main claim is as follows. Many studies have suggested that bilingualism improves your brain function and it confers, uh, confers protection against dementia. There are many, many papers that speak to those two things. However, there's a similar number of papers in the literature that show that there's no such a thing. The papers that show positive results, they are hypercited in the literature and they make the front, the front lines of newspapers. The ones that show negative results, they don't make it. They are not cited, they don't make it there. So a journalist comes after I, I, I give this lecture, right? They're, they're doing this interview, and he's, Dr. Garcia, will you tell us about, that? she sounded like this, uh, will, you, will you tell us about uh, your presentation today? And I go like, well, yeah, um, many studies have suggested that bilingualism boosts your brain. However, and I spent 10 minutes saying everything that I had to say against that argument. Next day, I turn on, turn on the TV, and I see, we have this uh, interview with Dr. Adolfo Garcia. Let's see what he had to say. Dr. Garcia, tell us about your talk. There's a lot of, the, many studies have said that bilingualism boosts your brain. End of the story. Thank you. They pretty much used me as a puppet to say exactly the contrary to what I wanted to say. Request veto power. Yeah? Make sure you have a chance to edit uh, or see what it is that will come out there. Um, so in a nutshell, um, science communication, let's do it. It is a social responsibility. We have all the tools that we need nowadays to turn this into a dialogical activity, which is the best way in which we can do this. Step into the other person's shoes in terms of what they might infer, in terms of how they will uh, appraise what is being communicated there and accept imperfection. So try to minimize these things, but also uh, accept that many of these, uh, many problems like this and many others that I could mention will happen, and eventually you will learn to do it better and better and better. The following slides are the complete responsibility of Dominic, I have to say. I didn't want to do this, but he said, come on, you have to end up on a, on a bright note, right? So I'm just going to say this. Back in 2010, I was giving talks for very, very few people, right? And I was doing it very, very poorly, right? Uh, then I started doing it better, and people were paying more attention. And we reached the point last year where we reached lots, lots of people. So the lesson here is keep at it, uh, be critical, be self-critical, be self-regulating, uh, and eventually you will achieve this. Dominic forcing you to play slides on your presentation. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, thanks so much, Adolfo, for that very thought-provoking and informative presentation. Are, are there any questions? We have time for one or two questions from the audience. Any burning questions, anyone? Um, if I don't see anyone, I'll start with something. So, um, as scientists, for those scientists in the room, we are not uh, trained in being science communicators. And we spend a lot of time as trainees, you know, learning about experimental design, rigorous scientific methods, mastering very complex technology, then doing data analysis, then writing the results, like painstaking process, up to the point of creating that knowledge. Then job's done, off to the next one. So. I think some scientists are actually a little bit afraid about talking to the media. So I want to, to know if you have any recommendations about how to break that barrier and also what is potentially the most challenging moment that you've had and, and how do you suggest uh, overcoming those fears. All right. So if you're a friend, and this doesn't apply just to scientists, right? I mean, if you're an artist, if you're uh, a caregiver, I mean, you have things that other people who have not gone through your experience no. So, first of all, appraise what you know, the, dis the distinctiveness of what you know, and do communicate it. If, you, if, you, if you're afraid, the best thing I would say is go and do it. 
I mean, face the fear and accept that most likely that fear will dominate you the very first times. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna stumble, you're gonna mumble, um, you're gonna say stupid things, you're gonna make mistakes, and that's okay. By the way, even the best scientists do it. I mean, the, and those who are well seasoned in in science communication. So go for it. The other things I would mention is try to. Um, Talk to someone who has gone through that process, right? And try to gain first-hand experience. And try to, try to ask for specific applicable tips rather than overarching, uh, very general notions about what to do. So I think that um, uh, those are a few things. Some universities have programs uh, that, that, that teach you about science communication, uh, and, but certainly more systematic efforts should be done, and it would be fantastic to incorporate this as part of the, the official curricula, uh, whereby scientists are trained. Uh, because if we believe that really uh, getting the results out there to those who are not scientists is part of what we have to do, then it sounds a little bit paradoxical that uh, the official uh, uh, syllabi and, and programs are not giving room to that. Great. Thank you so much for your thorough answer. And we have a question in the back, I believe. Hi there. Um, I just have a question for you. What are some reflective questions you would ask yourself as a scientist just to prepare yourself for miscommunication with journalism? Thank you for that very, very good question. Uh, first, um, I would ask someone who, who's not me to spot all the fancy and needlessly long words that, I, that I'm prone to using, basically, right? All the technical jargon, it can and should be removed. The fear that we have is that, well, this term is so precise and it captures this nuance and this nuance. Well, sometimes you can preserve the nuance at the expense of intelligibility. So. That, that's one thing. Have someone go through what, who doesn't know anything about it and scan those, those terms. Brevity. That's a, a, another thing. Try to see if you can find more and more concise ways of saying those things that you've sort of become accustomed to communicating in a certain, probably uh, a need, a needlessly long way. Uh, structure. Have a clear sense of if it's a presentation that you're doing or an interview, where, how you're going to frame the question, how you're going to develop it, and how you're going to wrap it up. And uh, if, uh, if it's something more dynamic, make sure you have your two take-home messages clear in your mind. So that no matter what the, whether the interview takes five minutes or 20 minutes, you make sure that those two ideas that you wanted to get across are part of what you got to say. Great, I think in the interest of time, we may move on to our next speaker. Um, so next is this- Thank you again. Round of applause, thank you. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to introduce Gronja Hope, who is a professional cellist and musician and co-director of Kids Cl Classics, um, an organization dedicated to creating music interventions in the healthcare, and also a trainer of musicians working in the health sector. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us, Gronja, today. And Gronja is also a Global Atlantic Fellow for Equity in Brain Health at GBHI. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you here today. Um, I'll just give it a second and I'm sure they'll bring up the slides. But I'm delighted to share a journey to co-creating creative care. That's a mouthful. Um, as a professional musician, as a music and health practitioner, and as the founder of what was called Kids Classics, is actually now called Music and Health Ireland. It spans the generations. I will be sharing two projects um, that Music and Health Ireland was recently involved with that were partnerships with healthcare settings alongside local authority arts offices, um, county cultural and creative teams, supported by Creative Ireland Creativity in Older Age funding. I will also share some of my experience within a cross-sector evaluation team that was involved with both projects and some learning for this. And also, um, I, I couldn't be here today without the voices of the staff and the people that we engage with, so there'll be a short video at the end. Hopefully we'll have time. I'll try to be 
brief. Um, so to start with a bit of background on Music and Health Ireland, uh, we're a leader in the field of music and health practice in Ireland and we have been bringing live music interactions into healthcare community and educational settings to, since 2008. We set up projects based on professionalism, partnership and the pleasure of shared musical encounters. We aim to be inclusive, to be creative and to connect with people through music, regardless of situations or circumstances. We advocate for shared artistic experiences which can support personal expression, new connections and enhance the well-being of the people we meet. The methodology and approach we use is consciously grounded in cultural interactions rather than clinical goals. And we deliver our work in three ways. We share live music in sensitive health settings, creating programs that respond to preferences of individuals we meet. We train musicians to work safely in busy environments which can have strict health protocols with residents and patients who may have complex health or access needs. And we support training for staff to explore the wealth of approaches of music making in care settings and its potential benefits to improve the quality of life and care relationships for residents and staff. We research and disseminate important learnings relevant to arts and health, and we advocate for appropriate resources and inclusion in policy to ensure that the national and local ambitions for arts and healthcare are realised and informed by arts and health expertise and practice. Our work as an organisation falls into four areas. Music in children's hospitals, music in general hospitals, music in older person settings, and I will share a little bit about one of the projects in this called Tea, Chats and Tunes. And uh, it also falls into music and health training, and I will share a project again that reflects this with our Musicians on Call project here today shortly. Um, this map gives you a, a, a sort of an extent of the reach of our work in 2022, which was in six children's hospitals through our Kids Classics program partnership with the National Concert Hall in Dublin. And our programs in older person settings were connected with nine HSC community nursing homes in the Midwest in Limerick, Clare and Tipperary, two nursing homes in County Waterford down on the southeast, and eight in County Meath. We had a team of 13 healthcare musicians, including traditional, folk, country popular and classical artists. And all our projects are carried out with professional musicians specifically trained to work in healthcare settings safely. Perfect. In order to understand, I suppose, our approach to co-curating music in the moment in healthcare settings, it is important to outline some of the differences between a performing musician and a music and health artist, whose role is not that of a music therapist. In brief, I have just taken four main areas for consideration, how, however, there are many more and many nuances within each of these. So as a performer, you would play on a concert hall or a stage, and the intention is a performance. Sometimes the setting is specifically designed acoustically, like the wonderful Wexford Opera House that we have in Ireland. Um, and the audience, by and large, are in front of you. It may also have ampli designed amplification, with, like the wonderful tech people we have here today. And in relation to repertoire, a concert generally has a set repertoire, and people know what to expect, expect when they come to this kind of setting. But as a musician in healthcare, this, the setting and space is now a clinical space, it's a workspace and it's home for some. It's a place of health, healing and well-being. And the intention is about the people we meet and their music. So our need is to be flexible and responsive. There's hard surfaces that impact volume and people are all around you. And the repertoire, it's about their repertoire and not all instruments are suitable for healthcare spaces. In the field of music and health, or as an artist, it, we're not an entertainer and we're not a music therapist, although there may be an element of entertainment and there may be a therapeutic side effect. It is important for musicians to understand and prepare for their role in the healthcare setting by undertaking training to acquire the appropriate skill set for best outcomes. Professional healthcare musicians would also engage with ongoing programme evaluation and reflect on their practice to develop and improve their skills in this field of practice. So one of the first programmes I'm going to share with you today is the one I mentioned, Musicians on Call. It was a project led by Limerick Arts Office in partnership with Music and Health Ireland as the artistic partner and the health service executive in older persons uh, settings in the Midwest in Clare, Tipperary and Limerick. The project collaborated with nine community nursing homes across this region and include in-person and virtual visits. The, 
The programme aimed to bring live music to older members of the community that, that was more than outside-in live broadcast. It aimed to promote health and well-being by improving the quality of life and cultural access for those who live and work in healthcare settings. And it aimed to grow a team of professional musicians to work appropriately and sensitively in these health settings in a person-centred engagement. It also offered workshops for healthcare staff to explore the wealth of approaches to music making in care settings and its potential benefits to improve the quality of life for residents and indeed the caring relationship between staff and residents. This was the element that was chosen for an, a part of evaluation last year. And just in brief, the workshops aimed to raise, I suppose, to support the needs of the residents and music activities during our Musicians on Call programme visits and indeed afterwards. And the invitation was sent out to nurses, healthcare assistants and nurse, um, who have forgotten, activity coordinators uh, to come along and enjoy a series of four pilot workshops which took place between July and August last year online via Zoom. And the activities that include, included sharing simple tools for music making to support um, engagement in a, pers a personalised, practical and fun way. We explored how words and music can be used as tools for creative expression and guided participants through examples of reminiscence through music. The evaluations aimed to um, identify existing awareness levels among participants of the benefits of music in supporting residents prior to taking part in the workshop and also uh, participants' perceptions of the benefit of music in supporting residents after taking part in the workshop. There were nine, um, nine recommendations made, in, including to consider an online and in-person option and to create an accredited Irish uh, healthcare training solution that combined person-centred music interactions and creative engagement. Most participants in the workshop had not received any structured or activity um, coordination training. Currently in Ireland, there is no standard of training required for this particular role, and no courses currently provide activity coordinators training that uses the prism of music to connect in a way that incorporates music and creativity. The second project I'll share a little bit with you today is called Tea Chats and Tunes, and it was a COVID response project in 2020 that continued to develop from lessons learned through the challenges met in the pandemic. It did this by being responsive in accommodating healthcare setting circumstances and for issues such as dementia and MCI. Through a partnership with Mead County Council, Age Friendly Mead, and supported again by Creative Ireland's um, Creativity and Old Age grant, the project evolved to respond to the need to find new ways of connecting nursing home residents with their families at home and abroad. In a phone call between myself and activity coordinator, I listened and heard the challenges and pressures that staff were under to support keeping connections between residents and families, in particular when language was difficult. I'm not paying attention to the clicker, my apologies. <laughs> um, the journey began to imagine the possibilities of co-curating a set of activities alongside nursing homes that supported resident staff and families. And the first of these was virtual visits to nursing homes that supported rebuilding relationships on, and social connectedness. Through the support of technology and a Zoom visit, music making was shared to support strengthening relationships between residents and staff in a time when social distancing and the lack of social gathering had a huge negative effect effect on mental health, well-being and quality of life for older people. Our second virtual activity, Across the Miles, supported connecting families together again. It offered families the opportunity to connect in with their loved ones in a meaningful way regardless of location. Music, conversation and memories were shared while new memories were being made. We connected one family that hadn't been together in over 10 years. Members of their family were in Addis Ababa, Cardiff, Meath and Waterford and we, we got to share new memories with them that, that, that will be lasting. We also developed a framework for a set of co-curated concerts by and with residents for their families. This involved a longer period of engagement in, with nursing homes and their residents with an aim to grow relationships, gather stories and share memories to amplify residents' voices outside of care settings. Supported by the musicians, the residencies culminated in a concert for residents and their families with an invitation for the families to join in. The these co-curated concerts were the element chose for the evaluation of this project. Uh, there was a set of nine recommendations that were made and it looked at looking at additional mechanisms to deliver the music residencies. Um, our initial intention was to deliver these final concerts online. However, circumstances changed and all settings would like wanted us to deliver this in person. But it was suggested that looking at online solu solutions, especially for the end of the residency, so families abroad could join in would be beneficial. Um, I'm going to skip that. I had changed. Sorry, this I've just given you 
a snapshot of that. Um, <laughs> but for me, one of the key elements was this cross-sector evaluation. And the key element at the core of this evaluation is about build, building bridges to support the sharing of knowledge and amplifying voices in evaluation. Key to both these project evaluations was the team of evaluators and their cross-sectoral experience and skill set. A common denominator between us all was our connection as Global Brain Health Fellows and our curiosity and interest in cross-sector engagement to improve the quality of life for people with dementia. The team of evaluators include Elaine Howard, who is a health project management consultant and evaluation, and Dr. Miriam Galvin, a social scientist and researcher working in health sciences research and clinical medicine. For us, these project evaluations was about balancing research with the rights of the participants and the change in environment. We recognise that the art of evaluation and research is to help to tell a story by uncovering information in a systematic way. It's not about a rigid scientific approach, but it should be rigorous. Our work was about learning in action, navigating each other's roles and the differences in language and meanings across sector. Some of the challenges we met included this, a short time frame for the project and this had a direct impact on the project. It meant that measuring impact me uh, metrics from the staff workshops was not possible. And with the Tea Chats and Tunes project, it meant that we were not able to get ethical approval to support the sensitive collection of a resident's voices. Um, learning from this evaluation identified the need to be flexible and to be responsive to the situation. The evaluation um, environment had COVID-19 restrictions, staff shortages, competing priorities within health settings that required responsiveness to emergent developments and a need for accessible research approaches. While the data collected methods were designed and agreed by all stakeholders at the start of the project, flexibility to circumstances was required, creating solutions that were time efficient and accessible for participants to contrib contribute in the evaluation. As a side of this, um, one, of the no one of the photos used in the presentation, I just want to point to, it feels out of place, um, in, is just over the evaluation there, and you see a set of tick boxes. For us, evaluation should not be a tick box exercise. And there's more than a sad face, a neutral face, and a happy face. We have to find new ways of, um, of gathering, and they're there, but in all our evalua evaluations, gathering the voice of the participants, that's just more than a tick box exercise. Um, I have a video which we'll show afterwards. I'm just going to, oh, that went the wrong way. Oh, yeah. um, so I leave the, the voice of the staff and the people who meet to the end, but I would just like to thank the wonderful resident staff and families who have been open to engaging with us through our projects. They have opened their doors, answered their phones, turned on their computer screens and shared music memories and their hearts with us. I'm also very grateful to the partners and funders that have supported our programs and, and projects. These programs have been reliant on annual funding awards that have limitations from awarding to the spending of grants, which often means that projects taking place for less than six months. This year we are still awaiting open call funding round announcements that may or may not align with arts and health practice and by and large are dependent on individual and local community champions. There have been great work that has started in cross-sector government engagement in Ireland over the last few years and this will support and impact uh, this space, however there is still to do. So I leave you with three questions. Is it not time for a commitment to prioritise and improve in policy framework that supports arts and health at national and local levels? Is it not time that arts and health professionals are included as key experts in the design and development of arts and health policy and programmes both nationally and locally and for cross-sector investment in research and education in the field of arts and health? I would like to imagine at a time in the near future that a cup of tea, a chat and a tune is possible in healthcare communities every day of the year. But before I close, I want to take a few special moments to thank a wonderful group of peers in the Arts and Health Coordinators Ireland network. AHCI, as it's known by its members, is a representative national network of professionals working across Ireland in a range of healthcare and community contexts who recognise the significance of partnerships and collaborations that exist and are possible within national and local structures and settings and the very real benefits and impact this opportunity brings. The very first meeting of the network was held on March 6 in 2003 and just last Monday we celebrated our 20th birthday. AHCI members bring together extensive leadership within the sector and it is our experience that high quality arts and health practice makes a valuable contribution to societal well-being and the quality of life across all communities. Um, thank you for, for listening to me today and I'm just going to share, they're going to hopefully get a video going there. It's best way to finish with a little bit of music. This was taking place in uh, 2021 in a wonderful nursing home, St Camillus's in Limerick. Oh, it's for to share a room as I worked out for the credit. And getting up late on Sundays, I never get to.
today we had one of our uh, regular two-week sessions uh, with uh, Musicians on Call, which is the group that come in and are working with our team to build on um, those therapeutic relationships that we have with our residents. We're evolving away from a medicalised model of care where we would have, you know, been very prescriptive about how we delivered care. It not only creates a feeling of well-being within our residents, but also within our team. We come in as the musician in the door and the intention is to offer a song which we hope will spark a memory. We love to be flexible with what we do but also to hear their voices. We're there about supporting their songs and their music. We couldn't do it without the, without the support of staff. It's like it's a friendship that develops. In some ways it feels like an extended family. And already today there's voices that might have been very quiet at the very start of this programme a year ago. And already they're jumping in with songs and requests. The value to me of music in this setting is about being alive and in the moment with music in a space that we're all doing this together. And that's for, be it for the musician, the staff, the resident, the family member, it's a shared experience that we all get to talk about afterwards. It's not so much what you can measure as much as what you can feel and I think um, if we talk about the arts, it's measured really through our senses. Sometimes when somebody's listening to music, their heartbeat can lower, you know, they can become so much more relaxed. Their breathing can become so much more relaxed. That's, to me, how the creative arts affect a person physiologically and psychologically, you know, and I think it's huge. Everybody seemed very happy. There was a smile in everybody's face. You know, people went in there they were after getting up and they were drowsy and they went in and, you know, they weren't themselves and suddenly the smile came on their faces and they were all extremely happy. Anything that supports uh, people and supports their self-esteem and gives them confidence, brings joy and fun, socially gets people together, singing, chatting together and having fun, you can't beat it. We spend all day every day uh, going from one thing to another and I suppose uh, telling ourselves how busy we are as well um, and our, our residents, they see that um, and that opportunity for the residents to know that this is their time, we're there for their time, we're enjoying the relationship that we have with them through that as well. For me, parking being the director of nursing for a short period of time to become that um, that person within this community at that level, it's invaluable. Wow, thank you so much, Gronja, for sharing with us your powerful work. Thank you. Um, any questions from the room um, in the back? Thank you, Gronja. That was a very educational video indeed. Um, during the, during the uh, traditional music festivals, as I said, that happened in, in, in late January here in Dublin as well, with traditional music, Os Berlogs, Os Gaelic uh, they said that there has a new music therapy degree being developed at Limerick University as we speak, and that it should be up and going within the next two years. Do you have any comments upon that, or do you have any thoughts about uh, the new music therapy degree being developed at Limerick, or uh, how do you think it will be progress over time, please. Um, I'm not familiar with if there's a new one. There currently is one running a, a two-year MA and it's turning out wonderful music therapists. Um, and it, to my knowledge, it incorporates all musical genres depending on the musicians that come into the programme. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see that. And I suppose our work complements their work. We're, we're not working in a clinical goal. We might be in a clinical setting. The work that we do is, um, is, a, is a creative interaction. And I suppose it's not part of a clinical treatment. Um, and there's no purpose other than to come in and engage. So the approach that we use, it's literally from artist, from musician to another artist and musician that's in the room. But it, yeah, anything that, that supports people in healthcare settings is amazing. There's space for everybody and there's a need for both. Thank you. Another question in the back. 
Hi, Gráinne. Thanks very much, uh, Gráinne McGettrick from the Glo um, for, uh, Atlantic Fellow for Equity and Brain Health and GBHI here. Um, and Gráinne, I heard your clarion call around the policy framework and the need to embed this work in, in practice, but I, I'd like to hear from you what you think needs to happen to ensure that there's equity for the artist as much as any other co-creator in, in this space. I suppose for me, being the artist that has set out on this journey and that's very interested in valuation is to have the artist included in the very start of these talks when you're setting up a pro programme that an evaluation that might have the potential to inform policy, the artist doesn't come on after the fact. They're in those early discussions because they understand the framework and from their arts and health experience and expertise that adds such value to, to the whole process. Um, and I suppose I, my call out is that that is included, this expertise and practice is included in those policy discussions to best inform what, what future policy might look like. Thank you for the question. We'll have an, a last question and uh, continue on with the session. Fine. Thank you. Thanks, Grania, that was brilliant. I'm curious about ethical approval in the context of a non-academic study or creating an archive of songs, stories and conversations with an aging population through mixed media art and music. Have you any tips on that? Um, the, the two evaluations that we currently sp I spoke of today um, had those challenges. Um, it wasn't associated with a research institution and, and I suppose with the experience of the evaluators involved, consent was always asked uh, um, um, and explicit and informed, um, but it wasn't something we were very careful because of the time frame often with, because funds come from the arts and cultural sector, they have to be spent within a, in a time. So it's not possible to follow people over a, a certain length of period. And as anyone here involved in ethics would know, it could take you six to eight months to actually clear ethics approval but that would be our next step is to see how we can make this into a bigger piece of research that we can actually safely gather people's voices. I know one of our, our next step would be subject to, to funding is to see how we can do that safely but that's where the experience of a cross-sector evaluation team comes into play. The artist and, the, and maybe perhaps the arts organisation can't do that on their own. It has to be linked with the university and researchers with this knowledge but there are the opportunities and it's exciting so I hope it happens soon. Great, uh, well let's give Gronia a round of applause before we move on. Thank you so much again. It is my pleasure now to introduce you to our next speakers, Owen Boss and Mark Cunningham. Um, uh, who yeah, maybe we'll sit and if we need to stand, we can stand. Uh, we will present together today. So Owen Boss is um, artistic director of the uh, multi-award winning um, Irish theatre production company, Anu Productions. And uh, Mark Cunningham is Professor of Neurophysiology of Epilepsy and Physiology at Trinity College Dublin. And today they will talk to us about a mixed media installation called Vernica's Area. And won't spoil the surprise as to what this has to do with. And I'm very curious to see your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I decided to sit because it felt we might look like um, yeah. presenting at Oscars uh, or something. Yeah, no, I, so <laughs> I think it's probably more relaxed. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're double act. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm Owen Boss, I'm a um, visual artist and designer, and I'm co-artistic director of Anu. And uh, at Anu, we, uh, uh, the other co-artistic director is Louise Lowe, and she's a theatre maker. So uh, we s have worked together for about 20 years, or coming up on 20 years, and we formed Anu in 2009. Um, and what we do in Anu is we combine visual art and theatre together and with communities of space, place and interest. And we kind of work from repositories of information uh, and we build teams of experts around that, whether they be uh, historians, sociologists, ethnographers, uh, scientists. Um, and we've kind of been known for uh, working in the commemorative uh, sphere. And uh, we've made a lot of commemorative work over the last uh, number of years. Uh, so the Wernicke's area is uh, our first kind of foray into uh, the realm of science, I suppose. And uh, this image that you're seeing now is an MRI scan of my wife's brain. Uh, my wife 
in 2014 had to have emergency surgery to remove a tumor from uh, her brain. Um, we didn't know anything about it at the time, but uh, she had to go into hospital and have this tumor removed. Uh, it was the size of an orange, the, the, the medical team told us. Uh, so uh, you can see on one side is pre-op, and then on the other side is post-op. I'm going to get it wrong, so uh, pre-op, post-op. Um, and it was over the Wernicke's area of the brain, and the Ver Wernicke's area is to do with communication and language. And so uh, she came through the surgery, really, uh, she flew through the surgery, came through that really well, uh, but unfortunately there was complications afterwards in which she contracted swine flu and then had to be induced into a coma um, over 11 days, they took her out of the coma. Uh, and she wasn't getting better, but then when they took her out, she started to recover. So uh, post, uh, she was in hospital for about two or three months, and then post all of that kind of, um, she has uh, epilepsy. Uh, based on this, um, the, the brain tumor, yeah, and it's over, as I said, over the, the Wernicke's area. So when Debbie would have uh, a seizure, it's based around language and communication. So she, uh, if she goes to speak, it'll come out in gobbledygook, and then if you uh, communicate with her, she won't be able to understand what is happening. And she would have a seizure about once a month, um, and they would. In the early days, they would have lasted for hours, uh, three hours, maybe longer. Uh, and then uh, over the course of the last, geez, coming up on 10 years now, um, uh, the meds that have been administered have kind of got her to a level where these kind of seizures don't seem to last as long. And then we've learned how to deal with it, that she goes straight to bed and that kind of thing. So in the early days where these were lasting a lot longer, um, being the artist that I am, I <laughs> was kind of going, oh, this is kind of interesting what's happening here. <laughs> that uh, she, like this kind of locked, like there was this two-way kind of communication thing that was, wasn't happening. Uh, and I started to think about this creatively and how, I wonder if there's anything I can do around communication or investigating this. So uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, the Science Gallery Ireland, uh, which was based in this building, uh, put out calls for rapid residencies where they would team you up with a researcher in uh, Trinity College. Uh, and that'd be Mark. <laughs> uh, and so I chose to work with Mark and uh, they teamed me up with Mark. And now it's your turn to thanks talk. Thanks very much. No, no thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, so maybe, I mean, it was really interesting what you said about methodology. And I think it is really important. And, and maybe I should sort of describe what I do and how I do it, because I think that's a really good place. Certainly to describe what you're seeing on this, uh, on this slide at the minute, because most of you just look at that and go, what the hell is that? So I'm an electrophysiologist or a neurophysiologist. What is neurophysiology? Neurophysiology is the study of the function of nervous tissue. So the thing between your ears, which is, you know, at the minute now generating lots of electrical activity, believe it or not. So if I was to take one of you and stick some electrodes on your scalp, which is a technique called EEG, electroencephalogram, you would see that your brains are producing this beautiful symphony of activity. And it organizes itself into discrete bands. And those oscillations or brain waves um, change depending on your functional state. So for example, at the minute, you should all be generating lots of fast activity, hopefully if you're listening to me. Um, if you're not and you're asleep, then your brain generates lots of slow activity. Okay? And so the brain can change. So the brain is a, it generates electricity. Now, of course, and this is perhaps an oversimplification, but the brain is like a seesaw. So in your brain, there are billions of synapses, trillions of synapses. And what those synapses or connections do is that some of them send a go signal, which excites the brain cells, and some send a stop signal, which inhibits. So in the brain, you have this very delicate balance between excitation and inhibition that's important for generating that normal activity. But guess what? That can also go very badly wrong. Okay, and as you can see in the case of, of Debbie, um, due to a tumor, which is the growth of these abnormal cells in the brain, that can upset that delicate balance. There's many reasons for why um, the brain can generate a seizure and that somebody then 
it becomes um, ha has epilepsy. Um, but I'm very interested in brain tumor related epilepsy, and that that was really the connection that we had. Now, what I do in the lab, which is quite unique, is that we then try and study how the cells, the brain cells generate good activity and how that activity then goes bad. And what you're seeing here is bad activity. This is a seizure, okay? So this is electrical activity that's generated by thousands of brain cells. And what we do is we have these tiny little microelectrodes that we can stick into brain tissue. Okay, now what you're gonna hear next is the really exciting part is that this is brain tissue from a human patient, okay? And what we have been doing is we've been working with the neurosurgeons, for example, at Beaumont Hospital. I'd previously worked um, with neurosurgeons at Newcastle University in the UK. And they are operating on patients, for example, like Debbie, who have a tumour. And of course, that tumour has to be removed. And as part of that operation, they take out the surrounding tissue, which is part of um, the, the networks that's producing this seizure activity. And so what we do is, again, it's with ethical consent, so the patient's consent that the tissue, this excess tissue can be used for uh, experimental studies in the lab. The tissue goes into this brain juice that we make in the lab and that keeps the brain tissue alive. And then what we do is we cut very thin sections of brain tissue. These We call them brain slices. And the brain slices contain the neurons and they contain some of the tumor cells. And that is the activity that we can produce. So that's fantastic because what we have then is we have in the lab uh, an approach that allows us to look at this diseased human brain tissue and then try and understand why the seizure activity arises. So, of course, when we do these recordings, this is electrophysiology, um, we then use it to test novel hypotheses that we might have about how can we develop better ways to stop the seizures that are associated with brain tumours, because there's some very interesting uh, and unique biology about that process, which I I'll not go into today. Um, so, um, so, of course, what we do from an experimental point of view is we record this and we capture it on a computer. So the black trace is essentially, it's the electrical signal, which is just a series of, um, uh, of numbers. It's, uh, uh, we, we take an analog signal and we digitize it, and then we can represent it as a color representation here. This is just the signal, but as a spectral, in, in the spectral uh, content contained within it. But one of the things that I was always interested in is that, you know, we as scientists, we do a lot of stuff visually, but whether we could think about representing this data in different ways and different modalities. And so you're probably hearing this kind of rumble in the background every so often, which is outside here in the exhibition. And as part of the project, what we did was we were really interested in trying to think about how we could represent this sort of this um, pathological activity in a different modality. And so uh, what we did was we, we've taken these signals and working with sort of the rest of the people in the project team, we, we thought about actually presenting this as a, as a sort of, as a, as a noise, as a signal that could be um, something that you could hear. Um, and I think that is quite profound because you really get the sense of the kind of impending doom mm. that's associated with these events. And a lot of people who have epilepsy will sometimes get these pre-seizure auras where they feel, uh-oh, something's about to happen. So I thought it was a very interesting way to think about taking what is sort of this you know, data that we collect in the lab and then sort of trying to interpret it artistically in a slightly different way. And we had um, the rapid residency had put us in contact, so, and it was pandemic, so we were doing all these uh, kind of rambling meetings uh, of chatting and chatting for hours and hours about different things. And, uh, uh, and the first time that Mark played this, um, uh, this seizure activity to me, uh, I, it was just kind of blew me away. I was just, this is absolutely amazing. And I started to kind of see it as um, playing through a really good sound system and using a subwoofer in order to get the bass tones of it and to, to make that loud enough that it would physiologically kind of hit you yeah. and it would hit you in the, 
in the chest almost, like you get it to a right level where it actually physically, it's not just about hearing it, it's about physically feeling it. Uh, and that was like one of the first ideas I had, and that was like two or three years ago now. <laughs> and it actually, it didn't change. Now, very often those ideas will change through, um, through research or whatever, but that never actually changed. And I think it's a really integral part of the uh, exhibition. The other things that we talked about was uh, this neurophysiologist, neuroscientist, sorry, is that right? Neurophysiologist. Okay. He's, he's, yeah, he's really the first. Well, the, yeah, the most one of the most famous neurophysiologists. Uh, Sherrington. Yeah, Charles Scott Sherrington, who uh, gave this keynote lecture in the 1940s, and I can't believe I'm talking about him. So I'm going to hang uh, up. To <laughs> so he won the Nobel Prize in the early um, 20s, uh, the 1920s. Um, because he was one of the people that uh, discovered that there were these specialized connections between brain cells, which are the synapses. So synapse is a Greek word that means to, to, to clasp. That's what they look like. They're kind of make, sort of holding halves. There's a tiny little gap between them and you get like chemical, the neurotransmitter, which I talked about, the, the excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitter, and it gets released and then it diffuses across these tiny little clefts, you know, at least you're working on like nanometer distances, and then it causes an effect on the other side. And so Sherrington, um, yeah, I kind of gave Owen the kind of the download of, of all neuroscience. I just kind of talked at him. Yeah, it was great. And, and <laughs> you know, I think because, you know, we were just uh, in sort of splendid isolation of yeah. Zoom. Um, but Sherrington, uh, towards the end of his career, as a lot of Nobel Prize winners do, they kind of feel that they can kind of go off piece a little bit. And sort of <laughs> but he wrote this really, you know, interesting book, which is called Man and His Nature. And th there's a lovely, this lovely, quote uh, the section from it, which I think, you know, it stayed with me for a very, very long time because I think, as I said earlier on, you know, in the human brain, there are like uh, over, a, I, I always get this slightly wrong, there are billions of neurons, but there are trillions of connections. And the analogy that people say is that, you know, when you look up at the night sky, you know, you, there are more connections within your brain than the stars you can see in the night sky. And, and Sherrington spoke about it as this idea of, you know, this enchanted loom where millions of these flashing shuttles weave this dissolving pattern, always a meaningful pattern, though never an abiding one, a shifting harmony of sub patterns. And that comes back to this idea that, you know, our brains are generating this sort of symphony of electrical activity. But it, it's, it, the thing to remember is that that's always on the edge. You know, anybody in this room can have a seizure. Doesn't mean you have epilepsy, by the way, but any, all of our brains are capable of having a seizure. And it doesn't take that much to just tip it over the edge. Um, so, so then that kind of, that, this quote then sort of inspired you. Yeah, so I was kind of, this, the, I started to think about tapestries and fabrics and, and, and actually trying to get them produced and trying to, develop some sort of language or lex visual language or visual lexicon uh, to do with Debbie and her narrative and uh, all that kind of stuff. And I did some uh, site visits to the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry where they have a working jacquard loom and I filmed that and uh, recorded it and kind of saw how it worked. And, um, and then I started to develop ideas of kind of how to make this design or patterns um, and to, to kind of hide signs or symbols of Debbie's kind of narrative within those structures, I suppose. Uh, so I, I based the whole thing uh, structurally on the chemical... What are they? <laughs> the, it's the chemical structure of, chemical the, structure. of the two anti-seizure medications that Debbie is, is currently on. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'd asked Mark to, and I said, oh, what are those things? You know, there's a, there's a box <laughs> and then there's lines coming off it, they're chemical, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so he sent these to me and I started to use these as kind of uh, almost the initial kind of exploration of structures and stuff like that. So this is an image from my uh, sketchbook, which I don't normally show, uh, but you can see I'm starting to play around with kind of these patterns and stuff. And then starting to introduce uh, things that are uh, pertinent to, to Debbie and her story, and then they end up being developed. And I was looking at uh, the work of William Morris and how he had kind of made these really complex kind of patterns for wallpaper or tapestries or and uh, and how to actually start to make those things. So I developed these eight uh, particular uh, uh, patterns. One in the top 
left will have Debbie's medication of Keppra and Lamictal into a floral pattern. The one next to it has a, an orange, a couple of oranges in it, which is to do with me seeing this tumour as just an orange because of the medical, what the medical team. There is images of Debbie in there. There's also images of tumour. There's images of uh, MRIs and that. And then, so I worked these up into, um, into patterns uh, for each of them, with each with different kind of colors, uh, color codings in them, and then I'd located um, a company in San Francisco that has a digital jacquard loom, and you can kind of upload your um, your designs to them, and then they will weave. Uh, or produce these uh, tapestries, these fabrics. And so I uploaded all of these. So we had eight patterns made, which were ended up being two and a half meters by two meters, and they're all hanging out. Uh, six of them are hanging outside. Um, and so I had these uh, produced, and in them, as I said, there's all these kind of symbols and signs to do with uh, Debbie and her narrative. Uh, Debbie was also uh, a trained soprano singer. Uh, but she can't remember lyrics, so she goes to sing a song, she'll often kind of mess the song up. Um, and so I'd worked with uh, a composer called Emily Howard, who was based in the Royal Northern College of Music, in a department called the Practice Research in Science and Music. And we had worked on a, a commemoration of Peterloo, which is an event that happened in Manchester. Uh, and she had composed a new piece of work. And uh, so I commissioned Emily to uh, make a new piece of work based on uh, this whole kind of creative process and brought her over. Uh, and uh, when Debbie has a seizure also, she writes uh, a seizure diary entry. So she'll record how, what, and how she's feeling and what has triggered or what she thinks has triggered and what physically is going on with her. Uh, so. Uh, we used that within the creative team to kind of build this work, and Emily went off and composed a number of pieces. Uh, she also um, she also uh, used Deborah's f uh, Debbie's favourite uh, aria to sing when she could sing uh, uh, Handel's Ombre My Fu, and she used that as a kind of structure in order to uh, to to produce these pieces of work. Uh, she also used the structure of uh, the brain activity that uh, Mark's lab shared. So Mark's lab shared it over to, uh, to PRISM. And uh, so she wrote for viola and she wrote for mezzo-soprano. And then I opened a weekend of uh, the exhibition at IMA, where uh, Anu was in residence. Um, we hung the exhibition and we had the live performance of these three new works that uh, Emily had composed. Uh, we also, I also invited in a, a sound designer called Bo Fan Ma, who's part of PRISM as well, to uh, develop a sound design, uh, again, dealing with uh, Debbie's narrative and uh, sharing the, the seizure diaries, and Bo Fan kind of hit on one particular uh, entry, which had to do with when uh, she was due to pick up the children uh, from school, and they went to school in town, and she was in pennies, and she had a seizure, uh, and she started to feel the seizure coming on, and then the next thing she remembers, she was standing in the front, uh, at the front gates of the school, so she's no memory of watching, walking down. Uh, the kids go to school in, in Gardner Street, so she's no memory of doing that walk from Henry Street down to Gardner Street, so both, uh, brought both on over, and he did a sound walk and recorded the ambient sound uh, of that particular walk that Debbie has no recollection of. It. So it's about 15, 20 minute sound walk that he did and then he started to work that up into uh, a sound design where he started to introdu introduce kind of medical sounds and um, other sounds that are pertinent to the, to the exhibition. So, And then, uh, so the live performance started in the gallery space and then moved out into the kind of colonnades and then finally finished in the center of the courtyard at IMA. Um, and so the exhibition is here, it's up, it's up the stairs there and at the back. So that's what you're listening to if, when you go in to see it. We also filmed that, uh, the first ombre that uh, Emily had, had written. Uh, we didn't capture the other two, but we captured the first one that was in the gallery space, and that's uh, on the screen that, um, in the exhibition here. We have six of the fabrics hanging. Uh, the information from, the data from uh, Mark's uh, lab is playing through the subwoofer, and then we have both and sound design uh, playing as well. And I think that is it. Yeah.
thank you so much for sharing that wonderfully inspiring uh, process um, and a uh, very personal process as well. Um, I wonder if anybody from the room has any questions for Owen or Mark? Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering about Debbie's response to all of this. How it's affected her, how... She doesn't know I did it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been really good. I think one of the actual uh, initial kind of really positive things was that I would go back to Debbie and I'd say, oh, this is the conversations we had. And uh, you know that thing where you can't actually speak? It's called aphasia because we've never been... We had never been told that. So there was these kind of... It was almost like, I suppose, part of the, 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 the work was... And un trying to understand what was happening, trying to understand what was going on, as mu as much as making a creative response was about kind of trying to understand what was going on and, and how things were working, you know. Um, so uh, I, know I would always uh, seek her uh, approval isn't the right word, but her permission to use stuff like her seizure diaries. Uh, and that still is ongoing. So uh, Emily has just recorded all of the, uh, um, she's just professionally recorded all of the uh, the ombres that we made, all the kind of the, the three uh, pieces. And they're going to be released next year on digital, uh, on Apple and Spotify and that kind of stuff. Uh, but she came back to, to ask if uh, for permission to use that kind of information from Debbie. So uh, it's been really positive, I think. Uh, and in essence, the work is a portrait, I suppose. And it's a portrait of her and her illness. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's also demonstrated the, the kind of linking into uh, the health service or the medical service and how difficult that can be and highlighting that kind of stuff in our heads. Uh, so even requesting her, like the MRI scan is, I had to request from her files and uh, part of that was, I had kind of thought about putting into the exhibition of email exchanges between uh, myself through her email address, because it's her that's applying for them, because it's her information, uh, and uh, the department that deals with that. Uh, and there was a delay because it's COVID and all that kind of stuff, and they're understaffed. And uh, but then it comes in a DVD, and it's like, oh God, what do I do with this? It can't. <laughs> like it, nobody has DVD players anymore. <laughs> like they don't. They're not on laptops anymore. Okay, yeah. I have to go and get an external one. Okay, I have a Mac. It doesn't work on Mac. Yeah. Oh my God, I have to get a free trial of Parallels so I can download Microsoft Virtual PC on a yeah, Mac. Yeah, yeah which is so. a nightmare. Yeah. So it's been really positive. Uh, and <laughs> but it has. Uh, and uh, and I think her under our, our understanding and her understanding of uh, what is actually happening is really key to it. Thanks so much. I think we're going to close it here in terms of questions because in the interest of time we have to move on. But we won't do so before a round of applause for Owen and Mark. Thank you so much. And uh, now I'm delighted to um, introduce Mark Davidson from Fighting Words, which is an organization that provides programs and mentoring for creative writing for young adults, children and adults with additional needs. And Mark is a program coordinator there with Fighting Words, and we're looking forward to hearing more about your work. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. Um, I suppose I'll just give them a minute to get the slides up. But uh, my first thought listening to all these wonderful speakers was <laughs> kind of, what am I doing here? Because <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind when I think of who am I, I think, well, I'm just an adult who's yet to grow up and who continues to enjoy, well, things like ball pits and playing with language. But as this is Creative Brain Week and we all as far as I can tell, have brains, I guess fighting words is quite an apt way to finish because I like to think of what we do as just reminding everybody, no matter what age they are or who they are or what their station in life is, that we're all creative, we all have imagination. Um, and that 
it is a very personal opinion of mine that it binds us all together as humans. I don't know if there's Terry Pratchett fans in, <laughs> but uh, he, I can't remember the exact line, but he talked about Homo narans as opposed to Homo sapiens in one of his novels. And that kind of really speaks to me. And given that that is who I am, I'm extremely lucky to work for an organization like Fighting Words. Um, what we do, as, as you so uh, ably introduced, we do creative writing workshops for children, teenagers, adults, uh, adults with additional needs, and really anyone who wants to work with us. All of our workshops are completely free. Um, and we've developed hugely since uh, 2009. So as, as you can read on the screen behind me, we were founded by Roddy Doyle and Sean Love in 2009. And the initial offering was solely for school groups. That was the initial vision. Um, if anyone's heard of 826 Valencia, they are kind of an equivalent organization of ours in the States. Um, so we were founded to bring a little bit more creativity into lives in Ireland. And from that point, we've gone from strength to strength. Um, to move beyond our initial mission, st our mission statement of working with children, uh, which was the initial one, we have, as you can see, added uh, adults who did not have this opportunity as children um, to discover and harness the power of their own imaginations and creative writing skills. So that's what we do. That's our headquarters in Dublin. But since then, we have moved um, all over Ireland. And the type of work we do in some 15, 16 locations around Ireland, it encompasses uh, uh, fiction, poetry, songwriting, graphic fiction, um, novel writing, memoir projects with, with older populations, including people in nursing homes and other populations like that. Um, and what blows me away, no matter what group I'm working with, is just the universality of imagination. And in just a few moments, we're going to test that universality here with this group. And we're going to get you to engage your imaginations in a moment. Um, but just before we do that, a kind of a very brief overview of the type of work we do. The focus at Fighting Words is always on the process and the actual engagement of the workshops or the types of activity um, that, that are being undergone. But most of the time, we would have outputs as well. So up behind me, behind me there, you have a selection of um, anthologies of, of short fiction by transition year students. We have some memoir projects by retired musicians um, who would have been doing the show band tours of Ireland in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they took the time to come together over a number of months uh, last year to kind of collect uh, and write down their experiences uh, and share them. Uh, yes, We Still Drink Coffee was a really, really worthwhile project um, with groups, uh, or sorry, with uh, female human rights defenders from, from around the world. Um, and uh, I suppose each one of these um, has a very, very different focus, but at its core, imagination is, is always at the heart of every single thing we do. And to kind of underpin it in the last four or five years, there's been a partnership with DCU and with other universities, but uh, our partnership with DCU has been extremely fruitful in uh, trying to analyze and quantify the type of work we do. Because for me, it's just, oh yeah, this is great fun. Imagination, storytelling. Um, and it is. You can see the impact you're having in the room beside you. But where I personally struggle, and where it's often quite difficult, is in getting that experience and translating it into quantifiable, um, measurable data. So that kind of work is vast, and there's too much of it to go into here today. But if you are interested, there's plenty to see. Um, I think the best way to finish this, because we all have been listening for a long, a long period of time, I would love to turn the microphone to you <laughs> in the audience. And if we can get a blank Word document up behind me in just a moment, we are going to try and engage in what a typical primary school group would do 
in a fighting words center, if you'll bear with me for five or ten minutes. So if we get a blank word document behind me, what we will do is try and engage our imaginative resources and let's bring ourselves back to the age of ten. And you've just entered a magical bright room and you're excited to be there and you are ready to start creating. So what we typically do with a group, we bring them in, we talk about what a story needs, what makes a good story, we'll have a chat about the types of stories they like. I've mentioned Terry Pratchett already, so we've, we've done that part. Um, and I'm just waiting for the Word document now to appear, putting the technicians under pressure. <laughs> but the thing we'll start with is deciding on a main character. And now as it is Creative Brain Week. We can be inspired by the week itself. We can be inspired by our location. We can theme it. We can do whatever we want, but I want three brave souls in the audience to suggest three options for a main character. <laughs> yes, thank you. And what is the mad brain surgeon's name? Is it Mark? <laughs> no. <laughs> Mark's a neurophysiologist. Yeah. <laughs> Laszlo? We happy with Laszlo? Yeah, fantastic. So, option one, a mad brain surgeon called Laszlo. Do we have an option two? Because usually in these sessions, we would have a number of options and then we would vote. One-legged cat. A one-legged cat. <laughs> Brilliant. What is the one-legged cat's name? Horace. Huh? Horace. Horace, Horace the one-legged cat. Fantastic. <laughs> and a third option, I think. Oh, competition will go. A timid Viking. Oxymoronic, if ever there was something. And what is this timid Viking's name? Oh. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> is, is there a specific term for a female? No, probably not, no. But, Vi queen. <laughs> a timid Vi queen called. Not Ragnar. Eleanor. Eleanor, okay. So a timid Vi queen called Eleanor. <laughs> have, you been to, have you been to Fighting Words before? Because it seems like experts here. Um, so what we'll do, and if you'll indulge me, I'll treat you as though you are a group of primary school children. <laughs> So I will ask everyone to close their eyes, and I will call out each of these options one at a time, and I would like a show of hands for which you would like. So, can I have hands up for Laszlo, the mad brain surgeon, please? <laughs> okay, hands down. Can I have a show of hands for Horace, the one-legged cat? And keep your hands up. I do need to... Try and get this as accurate as possible. Okay, hands down, thank you. And hands up for Eleanor, the timid Vi Queen. Okay, <laughs> yeah, hands down, thank you. Uh, Eleanor, the timid Vi Queen is our main character. So we can delete the other options, but feel free later today to revisit them and do your own writing about Harris, the cat, or uh, the mad brain surgeon. So, Eleanor, the timid Vi Queen, in most narratives, there is something that the character is aiming towards or shooting towards. Eleanor needs an ambition or not to be so timid. Perfect. So, option one, not to be so timid. Option two, a ship. A ship. Perfect. Option three, not to be seasick. Not to be seasick. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> a timid seasick Viking. I mean. <laughs> Woo, tough life, tough gig. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, let our typist uh, catch up as well, sorry. So, not to be so timid, a ship, or to overcome their seasickness. Hmm, not to be seasick. Brilliant. We know the process. So, can we close our eyes again, please? And the reason we do this, by the way, with the younger groups anyway, is to avoid the kind of catcalling and uh, you know pressure that people put on each other. I mean, maybe you guys wouldn't be so <laughs> so wild anyway, but we'll do it anyway. Um, so hands up for not to be so timid. 
this for Eleanor's greatest wish, okay? Hands down. Hands up for a ship. Okay, hands down. And hands up for not to be seasick. Okay, hands down, thank you. Uh, I think not to be seasick seemed to just shade it, so. <laughs> Eleanor's greatest wish is not to be seasick. Brilliant. Um, I'm conscious as well, if there's any online people clamoring in whatever way they're engaging with us to, to be included, um, we would love to incorporate their suggestions as well. But um, next up, Eleanor needs a greatest fear. Laszlo, the mad brain surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you know what, Adolfo? That happens so, so often in every group. A character, someone like, just makes it back in somehow. Yeah, bring him back. So Adolfo, the mad brain surgeon, option number one. So fear, option number one, Adolfo, the mad brain surgeon. Option two. Shorten that to, yeah, vomiting on her teammates. Oh, sorry, option one was, at, um, I was about to say Adolfo, was the mad brain surgeon whose name was Laszlo. Laszlo, the mad brain surgeon. <laughs> so option two was, so this is the kind of nightmare people would have, so it's a very relatable fear, vomiting on your teammates in a public space. <laughs> I don't know if anyone can relate to that up here. <laughs> um, number three, do we have a third? Sharks? Yeah, perfect. Excellent, sharks. Great stuff. If we can get ready to vote again. Choose your favourites. The online voting is quite challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of online <laughs> going on. So, hands up for the mad brain surgeon. Okay, hands down. Hands up for vomiting on your teammates in a public space. <laughs> okay, hands down. Hands up for sharks. Okay, thank you, hands down. The uh, victor is the mad brain surgeon. Laszlo, the mad brain surgeon, re-enters the picture. <laughs> uh, very appropriate for Creative Brain Week. Uh, finally, we would usually introduce a friend for the main character. So timid or not, this Viking or Viqueen needs a friend. A mermaid. Okay, a mermaid, and what would the mermaid's name be? Aurora. Aurora, Aurora, Aurora the mermaid. Brilliant. Okay, grown your whale. Now, <laughs> at this stage, I would remind us that we need original characters. <laughs> That are not historical or mythical figures. <laughs> oh, Gronya Whale. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Okay, Gronya Whale. And do we have any online, Dominic? Sorry. Uh, shy Elephant. Shy Elephant. What is the Shy Elephant's name? Hang on. Alice. <laughs> Alice the Shy Elephant. Alice the Shy Elephant. Okay, brilliant. So we have three fantastic options Aurora the Mermaid, Gronya Whale, <laughs> or Alice the Shy Elephant. So decide on your favourites and close your eyes. If we can have a show of hands for Aurora the Mermaid. Brilliant, hands down. Hands for Gronya Whale. Hands down. And show of hands for Al Alice the Shy Elephant. Okay, oh, this was a tight one, hands down there. Um, Gronya Whale just about edges it. Okay, brilliant. Uh, this is fantastic, guys. Um, and I hope you're taking some joy in it as well, the opportunity to create. So what we will do, if we have time, uh, I think I raced through the kind of introduction to fighting words, so we should have a few minutes. Uh, if we could put a few sentences together, and they'll probably be in pride of place on the Creative Brain Week Twitter or, or whatever at the end of this. So, <laughs> um, who would like to write the first sentence of this story? Eleanor 
was hoping to avoid going to sea because she would rather be in a bubble bath. Okay, sentence two from this part of the room. A key part of fighting words is trying to encourage everyone in the room to engage in some way. Um, I'll resist the temptation to actually go person by person. <laughs> but one more sentence, yeah. However, when she heard Lazla, the mad brain surgeon, mm -hmm. was coming to town, she opted for passage on a cruise ship. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Did we catch that? Eleanor was hoping to avoid going to sea because she would rather be in a bubble bath. However, when she heard Laszlo, the mad brain surgeon, was coming to town, she opted for passage in a passenger ferry? On a, on a cruise ship. On a cruise ship, sorry. For passage on a cruise ship. He meant no harm, but she was concerned he meant no harm, but she was concerned. <laughs> Excellent. At his recent attempts to sell brain juice. <laughs> to Gronje Whale. Brilliant. She just hoped she wouldn't get sick. Okay. What's next? Uh, we can have dialogue if anyone wants to embody Grania Whale. Sorry, say that again. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, she could say that to someone, I suppose. Don't know. Do we have another sentence or two? And then I'm conscious of time as well. But I'd like to. All aboard, and the ship sets sail. Fantastic. And perhaps if we try and get one more line that leaves this epic tale <laughs> on a cliffhanger moment, that might be inappropriate. Yeah, brilliant. Grania Whale did the antagonist to the brain juice in the end, and the biggest brain in the world grew even bigger. <gasps> Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> Grania Whale did get access to brain juice in the end. And the biggest brain in the world grew yet bigger. Guys, give yourselves a round of applause for a fantastic story. Okay. <laughs> So I'm sure that'll be published widely um, <laughs> across all forms of social media now. Um, but thank you for indulging me in that. I thought that was maybe the most effective way of communicating one kind of uh, type of workshop that we do. But in any Fighting Words workshop, it is participant-led. So I kind of crossed that barrier there because I was really <laughs> forcing everyone here to participate. But whether we're working with primary school kids, teenagers, or adults, young adults, uh, older people, it's always the voice of the participant that tells us how best to work with them. And they will tell us what kind of output best suits them. Um, every type of workshop is different. Every type of project is completely different. But in my experience, I've, I've been with Fighting Words now for about eight years. It's been hugely, hugely satisfying and eye-opening just seeing everyone, if given the chance. Um, I, I didn't mention, but we do workshops in prisons and youth detention centers, but every single person has that one thing in common with each other, which is the, the ability to create. And what we just try and do is give everyone the confidence in their own voice and the confidence to use that voice and a little bit of, I suppose, feedback that their voice matters. Um, so finally, the final thing I need to say, <laughs> which is the obligatory reminder to everyone that Fighting Words is run almost entirely on volunteer mentors and the kindness of their time. So if anyone does like the sound of what we've done, if you enjoyed the workshop today, uh, please do 
consider checking out our website, and if you have any time at all to give, we would really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So thanks so much, Mark, for giving us a taster of the experience of fighting words. I think if Mark um, Cunningham could measure our brain sim uh, symphony at the moment, it would be that much stronger and brighter. Uh, so with that, I thank you all for participating in the Creative Brain Week. Uh, and please join me again to give another round of applause to our wonderful speakers for sharing all of your knowledge and inspiration with us. Thanks.